This is Tyler, your antisocial critic and the host of the Antisocial Network, your number one source for anachronistic conversations online. Come join us each week to hear opinions from some of the best voices discussing entertainment, politics, religion, and modern life on the internet today. Most of which you've never heard of, but I have. This week on the show, we're uh, joined by Alaric Nodea. I'm trying my best to get that to pronounce it right after the last couple episodes. That's all right, no worries. He is a professor at uh, Suwon Science College in South Korea, and he's the author of a brand new book, The Bible on Cipher. Good morning, sir, professor. Hi, uh, good morning. How are you? It's it's morning here. It's evening there. Yeah, 15, uh, 14, <laughs> 14 hour time difference. It's, it's a fun to fun to handle. I I do it all the time because I have a bunch of uh, friends in the UK. So. But it's always kind of fun trying to figure out what, what, where exactly that time difference uh, balances out. You know, it, so, right. We, at least we don't have daylight savings or anything like that. So it makes <laughs> it less complicated. Oh, us, us poor Americans. So, you you teach in South Korea, but how did you kind of? I think we talked about this a little bit off uh, uh, when we were doing when I when I interviewed you last month for College Fix. But how did you kind of get where you are career wise? Uh, well, actually, I I started just teaching in a type of academy, the local kind of cram schools, and then from there I went into teaching in middle school, and uh, I looked for university work, and finally, some place was crazy enough to accept me, and uh, there you go. I uh, I, I started teaching and. Uh, and doing a lot more research because I obviously had more time with the middle school. I was pretty much flat out, so I couldn't do as much research as I wanted to. But these days I, I have more time and I'm getting into more deeper issues. And uh, yeah, it's a funny story actually. I, I, in high school, I had a really fun teacher in social sciences. And the one thing I told him, is, I will never be a teacher. And he told me, you be very, very careful of what you say. I said, no, I can't stand kids. They're all brats. I will never be, I will never be a teacher. And uh, there you go. I became a teacher and in social sciences. Don't hold it against me. You, you're from South Africa. How did you wind up in South Korea then? What was that journey like? Uh, it was one with many detours, I guess. I was I was born in a place called Amamzen Toti, which is in KwaZulu Natal. These names are going over your head. I know. Uh, not, as mu- not as much. I have my one of my uh, friends is a. I two of my friends are uh, missionaries down in South Africa, so I've heard a little okay. bit about it. So, all right, you you know more than most, then I'm I'm sure. <laughs> um, so KwaZulu Natal is is what was the Zulu Kingdom. They do still have a king. Um, and yeah, so I, I grew up there and I'm, I'm ethnic Africana. So it's kind of a weird place to grow up because there's not many of my ethnic group there. It's actually it was a British area. So they speak English there, even English and Zulu. So all my friends were Zulu growing up. I had, I can't remember it basically any white friends that's I, I grew up running around barefoot in the bush i know it doesn't look like it but <laughs> that's that's how it was and uh from there we immigrated to australia and then eventually became australian citizen and then australia got a bit boring sorry australia and uh i thought i'd see more of the world and yeah, I ended up here meeting my wife, getting married and continuing to stay on. And yeah, that's basically my story in a, in a nutshell. How did you wind up in lingui- or, uh, would you, linguistics or sociology? What, what, uh, what would you describe your, uh, your path? Uh, I'm, I'm a hodgepodge of everything, I think. Uh, uh, with language teaching, I guess I got more and more interested in the linguistic side of things. And I, I like history and I like learning new languages, new cultures. Obviously, I've been in a lot of different cultures growing up. So it's always been interesting to me. As, as a kid, I used to play a game. 
you probably get in trouble for doing it now. Um, I used to sit, because Melbourne and Australia, there's a lot of different ethnic groups. I mean, a lot. There's, I, I think, 186 languages spoken in the city. And uh, I used to sit and just watch people and try to guess where they were from based on their clothing, mannerisms, features. If I could hear what language they're speaking, that would be a, a good hint, obviously. Uh, so I've always been interested in people and society and how things work. So I guess probably my mind has been going in that direction for a while. Yeah. Are, you, have you, are you officially uh, done with your education? Or, because yeah, I remember when we, did, we were talking, you said you were just finishing up your doctorate. Uh, I, I finished my doctorate, but I'm doing more more master's degrees in this type of thing because I'm a glutton for punishment, apparently. <laughs> yeah, so... I, uh, I, uh, actually, the, the book was, was based on a lot of research that I did with the doctorate. So I thought... I, I had a lot of people nagging me, write a book, write a book. So I thought I'll take the information from there and collate it into a more readable version for, for the everyday person and then show how language works in that way. So that's uh, that's basically what I did. With, with... Here's one I prepared earlier. Um, <laughs> yeah, with, with the book. So yeah, that, that's, that's pretty much it. I'm not ask... sounding particularly eloquent today, but anyway. I was going to ask, I was curious if that was your master's thesis or if that was like just something you were doing on the side in addition to everything you do. Yeah, yeah it, was, it, was, it was from the doctorate, pretty much, yeah. Uh, I'd say about half of it is, is from research based on that. And then a lot of the research I did was kind of policy based. And uh, it would have been a bit boring, I think, for people to read because it's, it's too academic and dry. But uh, for example, which is not in the book is, is the language policies in Mexico. So how native languages are treated in Mexico and uh, the answer is not very well. So people complain about Western countries, marginalized groups, but there are groups that are very terribly marginalized in other countries and they get no attention. And uh, yeah, their quality of life is not particularly good because they don't have access to a lot of things. For example, if you speak a very small minority language out somewhere in the countryside in Mexico, and you don't speak Spanish, what's your what's your chance of getting healthcare or something like that? Probably not particularly good. So people don't think about these things, but they, they like to complain in Western countries because the price of their low-fat cafe latte went up by 10 cents or whatever, something ridiculous. So yeah. Um, so that's that side of things is a bit dry. So I just took that out and kind of put other things in there. Well, let's jump into the the content the content of the book. My uh, my co writer at the website I, I write at Cultural Review, she bought a copy of it after I uh, sent her the inter the uh, interview we did a couple about a month ago, and she's she's uh she hasn't finished it yet, but she really likes it. And she was saying you write very clearly and very accessibly. And what well, what is your uh what what do you explain the book as when people ask for your elevator elevator pitch on that? Oh, uh, that's that's confusing to me as well. I've been thinking about how to describe it, but uh, it's, I'd say, an introduction to linguistics for the lay person. It has the history of language. It has how writer, uh, writing has developed and how written language has developed over the years and different systems that are in place that have been used and are still used. And then it also talks about how language is a very powerful tool to controlling large populations, and it has been for a long time. And I discuss uh, the kind of language that was used very effectively in Nazi Germany, and how that uh, that language pattern or that pattern of control has now become a kind of textbook, I suppose, for how to control populations, which is quite frightening. I think Orwell picked up on that quite a lot earlier than many people in, in 1984. He was onto something. I know it was meant to be 
a novel, but uh, he was certainly seeing something there that uh, is definitely a pattern that's happening. And really the book talks about those patterns. It's not a partisan thing. It's something that anyone can do, which is probably why it's so frightening. I mean, it doesn't matter what ideology you are. You can just latch onto this, use it, and cause a massive amount of damage to to everyone. Yeah, I mean, so I, I, you you talked about when we when we did the interview about a month back. You talked about how you don't subscribe to any political affiliation, either left or right, and it, it. But you did get a lot of backlash for the article you wrote back in February. Have you? What's the what's the feedback on the book so far? Uh, the feedback on the book so far has been very positive. I, I, I was, I'm always very confused about how people are going to react about things because that article that I wrote, and the interesting thing is I, I have uh, a lot of connections globally from Pakistan, China, Japan, Korea, uh, North America, uh, you name it. And I, I talk to a lot of people from very, very different backgrounds. And I also have quite a few contacts and friends that happen to be American and they happen to be black. And we've had discussions. And these are, these are people with their own inclinations and, and all these kind of things. And they have their own view on the world. But this is something that we all agreed on, this, 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 how should I describe it? Obsession with, with, with race is, uh, is not a healthy thing because um, these, these are all very high achieving academics and some of them have really experienced proper racism in their, in their time. But even so, they do not ascribe to, to a lot of these kind of ideologies that are being pushed now. If anyone were to ascribe to that, you would think it would be them from what they've been through. And I'm not just talking, someone said a bad word to them. I'm talking about continued harassment over long periods of time, very hard situations growing up. One person was in a gang and uh, there's, uh, there's actually a professor. His name is um, Isaiah Rashad. And he's a black American. And he was in a, in a gang and uh, he decided to leave when he was, I think he was 10 or 11 and they almost killed him, like literally almost killed him. He was in hospital for days and uh, he, he was in that situation because he, he couldn't get a proper education. He couldn't read or write. And then throughout his life, people have helped him to get educated. And even though he, he was in such a terrible situation, his, his story actually kind of reminds me of Thomas Sowell's story. You know, he, he got a library card. He was told that he couldn't get a library card because he was a criminal type thing. So when he got it, he was, he was so happy. Even though he couldn't read, it was like something that he'd achieved. And now he's a professor and he's, he's um, teaching, you know, people, in a very similar situation to himself. So I see those kinds of people and we, this, this is a very long round away story to get to the main point, but I've had discussions with people like that and they're all kind of sick of this, this black, white, Asian, whatever thing. So I wrote that, that particular article, kind of let's, let's break away from this very racialized view of society which is not a healthy way to see the world. And I haven't spoken to, to those kinds of people who all agreed. I thought it's, it's a very tame article. I, you've read it, I'm yeah. sure. I, I, I didn't see anything particularly controversial except that I poked fun at uh, Robin D'Angelo. And that, that seemed to annoy a lot of people. So you see there, there is in academia parasitic individuals who will do anything to make money and they don't care who they hurt. That's the bottom line. You, 
now academia is it's 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 like an apple you can explain the the whole entirety of the universe with an apple apples are beautiful they're delicious but the rot usually starts from the middle and even though the apple looks nice from the outside the inside is all rotten what happens when you take a bite you find out it's full of worms well this this is what's happening with academia and it's been happening for since the i think for western countries probably since the 1950s 60s but it's been a slow process dry rot is usually a slow process i mean uh i think it was william f buckley was writing in the 1950s that this was all this was all happening at, at, at major colleges like yale then and it's just continued to happen and slowly kind of work their way outward i mean as someone who lives in america and who has briefly flirted with the uh with the academia i i can definitely attest that there's a lot of a lot of the stuff you kind of observed is it's it's more on it, america's essentially on fire <laughs> it's, it, it's it's much more intense in the fray uh and it, there's not a lot of forces actually that either are pushing back or have the ability to push back on it right now within or without just because it's so deeply ingrained within the uh within the academy it's it, it and no, no one quite knows what to do with it. How much has that influenced the academy outside of the United States in your experience? Um, it depends where it is. Australia has gone very much the way of uh, America already, and the UK as well, especially with with a lot of the laws they bring in to protect this group and protect that group, and. Uh, when you when you be, when you start to to create smaller and smaller laws to control everything people do it ends up causing a whole bunch of other problems that you probably didn't foresee before putting that in a lot a lot of things are do, done with good intentions but there's the saying that the road to Hades is uh, paved with the good intentions i was i see i avoided that other word I used to hate is I'm very smart. Um, so we can see that spreading there. I think in Asia it, it's slowly starting here, and that's that's as a result of the American influence. It's slowly coming in. I think it's been much slower here because the culture is is much more more isolationist and they're a lot stricter in their cultural beliefs so they don't like things to that are kind of outside of that which which can be a good thing because it's protected them until now but uh yeah it, it is slowly beginning china on the other hand they've just said straight out in the universities we're not having any of this and they're, they're, they they've actually now made boot camps for men to be more manly i i just saw this in the the news recently it's like if you want to be a weak man we'll we'll fix that for you yeah so i think a lot of countries they they seeing this happen and they say yeah no, we we won't we won't be going that way thank you very much and i think you know western universities have been in a very elite position for a long time and maybe become very complacent in that position much like any empire that uh, that reaches a pinnacle they think they're above being conquered but i think the asian universities are going to be a very big threat to western universities in quality of education in price wise i don't understand why western universities are so expensive i guess if you need to do feminist dance theory and employ all these professors in random subjects that aren't really subjects then you you have to pay a lot of money but there's none of that here so yeah the the western universities are in big trouble as far as I'm concerned and now with corona they can't hold on to their students as well so we'll see but uh, in my opinion the next 10 years will be very telling 
I think there's going to be a lot of doors closing in, in Western places as people realize that, you know, they're paying a lot of money for very little. I don't know how, what your experience has been. In... Well, I, I have not. I mean, my my degree is in audio engineering, so it's not. I, I didn't spend. I didn't uh, romance the academy too deeply, but I did. I have spent a lot of my years since uh, gradu- graduating, kind of going back and starting to re-research stuff because I do. I do a lot of uh, classical literature reviews for various publications online, so I, I'm digging through a lot of the, uh, the literature on older poetry and stuff like that so a lot of it's just... well now they want to get rid of chulsa <sighs> they're, they're gonna, they're, gonna like... they're gonna cut off every branch until the tree is out of leaves it's it's <laughs> it's well to to make a comparison imagine that you you want to study chinese literature but you don't want to learn about anything Confucius said, Lao Tzu, or uh, any of those people. It, it, it doesn't make sense. How do you learn with the full picture? And this is also, you know, this is what I get to in the book as well. When you start to, to cut down on things that are uh, viewed, Hitler and his, uh, his cronies, they use the term harmful and undesirable. You can get away with a lot of things by saying harmful and undesirable because pretty much anything can fit into those two categories. Undesirable, I don't like it at this time. So that gets to go on the the pile to be burned. And um, we're getting to a point now where more and more of this is happening. So you have a a smaller, smaller scope of knowledge from which to work. And uh, that's frightening because that's what happened in the Third Reich. You you had things that were permitted and were not permitted, and uh, we all know what happened in the end. They had a massive bonfire, and the universities did nothing. I wrote a paper recently on, on the, the academic inquisition, I call it, because uh, it, it acts like an inquisition now. If you If you are a heterodox thinker outside of this new orthodoxy that they created, you're in big trouble. I mean, your funding wise and all, everything related to advancing in academia is pretty much cut off from you. You will toe the line or you won't be in it. It's a very exclusive club now. Personally, I don't care what anyone thinks. That's why I do what I do. But uh, as a result of that, uh, we're, we're, we're heading to a very, very dangerous place in regard to what people can do because this rot always begins in academia. When, when the Nazis took over the universities, none of the universities said anything. They cut all their Jewish professors. In, in um, Lvov, in... in Poland or Ukraine, uh, the the actual professors, which were Nazis, they they went in and they killed all the professors that were Jewish or or anti-fascist. And at that time, anti-fascist was actually a thing, not not just a rebranding of fascism. So, uh, yeah, academics were at the head. The the, the main fellow, he, he had two PhDs as well. He was a very highly educated fellow. And he went in and he uh, he ordered the SS guards to shoot all the professors and their families. And that was the end of any opposition from academia. They, they took it over very quickly. I mean, a lot of the energy for these revolutions tends to start with the students, doesn't it? In, in most cases, I, I mean, it, with the, whether it's the, the Russian Revolution or the French Revolution or Germany or... I mean, it always you're in America's case with the uh, the counterculture. It always seems to kind of start with the students and just kind of work its way outward from there. Right, right. In in, in the Ukraine case, the Lvov case as well, it was students who drew up the lists of professors they didn't like 
for the Nazis. And then that professor came in and had everyone shot. So it's a pattern that's repeated because, I mean, students to a degree, they always think they know everything <laughs> because they're at that stage of life where, you know, they're, they're exploring ideas and, and that kind of thing. And they, they're smart. They're smarter than what is good for them, but they know less than what they should. So they're, they're not at that maturity stage. And, and that's what a lot of radical ideologues latch onto because they're able to, you know, tweak the thinking in the direction that they want. And there's always, there's always a kind of an, an underlying victim ideology. It doesn't matter if you if you look at the, the, the Nazi case or the Soviet case, wherever you look, there's always an underlying victim ideology. The German people are the victim of the Jew because the Jews have been doing this to us. So we are the victim and therefore it justifies the means to the end. So we see this, this, this continued process, regardless of where, where we go to. Genocide, generally, there's some kind of a victim-oppressor narrative going on. They're oppressing us, therefore we kill them because they, they deserve it, because they did this to us. It's just, just this re repeated cycle that no one seems to, to get, but it's there. And students play a big part because they, they give the, the push for that momentum. Yeah, it seems like nowadays, especially that, that generation of students really has taken over, like... The, the especially the low level positions in a lot of the major institutions, especially in the United, especially in the United States. I mean, we, well, we we just just last year, like a lot of the big heavy hitters at the New York Times got chased out by the like like Barry Weiss. Did you hear about her? Yeah. So it seems like a, a lot of this just seems like it's getting ingrained to a dangerous degree. Do you think that? What do you think this is all just going to lead to like a the the floor falling out under all these institutions or do you think that this is going to create more tension until something happens you, or, or is it just or is this just, is this all just a prelude to China taking over everything and exerting soft power on the world it, well, it could be um, <laughs> what what we can do is, is have a look at the the historical uh, precedent that's been set and what happened is uh, in the case of Nazi Germany and the areas that they annexed what they did is they they took control of all the university programs like I mentioned before and they they had a system of what they allowed to be taught and they also had forbidden forbidden libraries so these are libraries inside the uh, inside the universities, which had books that were banned, but they hadn't burned. They'd only kept one copy or so of each. And that was just so that people that were very loyal to the party who wanted to point out the faults in that literature could get special access to that literature. So we see a similar thing like that happening today in universities. There's, there's forbidden knowledge. You can't say this, you, you, you can't, publish this, you can't, whatever. Um, now, where that leads to is that you just have this one continued message. In the general population, though, that that causes, that causes a loss of trust in the institution, and we're already seeing the loss of trust in universities to a very large degree in Western countries because they're teaching all kinds of things that have no no scientific basis. I mean, even in the social science, social sciences are, are pretty much dead. But uh, then what happens is you get lower enrollments. And we've seen that happen. The same thing happened in Germany. As the, as the universities became more extreme, even though people were indoctrinated, less and less people were enrolling in the universities. So finally, some universities, they had to close and they weren't closing just because of the war. They were closing because there were no students that wanted to go there. So some universities in Germany, they were closed for like 
10 years and they opened again after the war when there were actually people to study and they had to revamp the whole system. I mean, they, they invented entire new fields like the prehistoric studies in Germany. There was already a prehistoric field, but they, they revamped it with Himmler's new uh, occultist twist on things. And uh, they were saying like, it's, it's about 4,000 BC and Germany has aqueducts and these massive buildings <laughs> and helicopters and <laughs> you, you name it. We're, we're this amazing race and that's where our ancestors come from. And uh, yeah, so, so we, see, we see entire fields created. There were renowned uh, prehistoric researchers in Germany at that time who then protested. And they said, this is, this is destroying our field. They either got told very clearly that they would be gifted with a bullet in the back of the head if they continued or they just left the country. And, and many did. Uh, some went to become curators at museums in America. Some went to other countries um, and got tenured positions there. So. Overall, that led to a decrease in the level of the intellectual uh, research that was going on because it, it was just propaganda, basically. We see this now, too, with, with gender studies, all these kinds of things. The, the, the idea of there being more than one gender was created by a person called John Money. Have you ever heard of him? I've heard, yeah, I've heard, I think I've heard the story. Is it, he, I believe he was the one who experimented on the two boys. And... Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, he was a pedophile as well. And uh, the interesting thing is a lot of the work that he produced, we call it work in the, in the, in the lighter sense of the word. Yes, this, <laughs> exactly. Um, it, was, it was based on, on rape records by Nazi pedophiles. That's, that's how he justified his work. Well, yes. And he, he also said that, well, if, if it's, it's apparently not rape, if it's consensual, if the child allows it, then it's, it's fine, apparently. That is all forgotten. But the thing that he created, this, this gender ideal, somehow everyone just takes that and runs with it. I'm not sure why. But you see, what? The problem with, with research, too, is that when you have this base, the things get built onto the base continually. And then afterwards, you don't know where that base is. But the, the problem with having a base like that is if you build a building with a bad foundation, at some point, it's going to give way when the weight of the building is beyond what that foundation can support. And this is where we're going with academia. The walls are cracking and people just keep saying, oh, we'll just put more concrete on the wall. It doesn't fix the, the basis of what's wrong. So if you build on wrong ideas, you're going to have maybe a building that looks wonderful from the outside, but it's going to cave in and destroy everything under it at some point. And uh, that's, that's where we are now. The cracks are showing. We we probably got about five minutes left on the uh, Zoom call, but I I thought I would uh, give you a chance to kind of defend your centrist uh, bona fides. Do you, what do you uh, do? You see any of the same stuff coming from the uh, the the emergent far right too? Um, I think they feed off each other. Yeah, I, I wrote a I wrote a paper. You know, you have these you have these two forces that in their twisted ideologies. They, they need something to push back off of because it justifies their, their approach. So for, I don't know, extreme far-right, neo-Nazi, KKK types, when a black person shoots someone, they say, oh, yes, this is great. See, it, it proves our point about all those people. And then when you have the ones on the very far opposite side, now everything is some white issue, they say, oh, that white guy shot someone, it, it proves our point. 
these two groups just continue to feed off each other until it reaches some kind of breaking point in society. And it radicalizes a lot of people because you have, you have people that are not as clued up as they should be. And then they get fueled by the media and they decide, oh, this point is right. or that point is right without having a look at both sides. I prefer to be in the middle, especially because of my work, I can't justify a position if I have been somehow pushed to one side or have my, my vision corrupted in some way, my biases affirmed in some way, and therefore have my work have a bias that it shouldn't have. I think social sciences, that's how it was meant to be in the beginning. But now it's gone so far off onto one side that people just keep regurgitating their own garbage. If you can't see to the, the point of the fact, how can you explain the situation? Or how can you understand the crux of the matter? You can't do it. That's why I don't think that academics should be um, activists. They should be doing their job, which is teaching and allowing students to reach a conclusion an educated conclusion by themselves, not force feeding some ideology into their brain. Uh, uh, an intellectual's job is to present the information in as unbiased way as possible, even if that information is terrible. For example, we discuss the Nazis. No one's saying they're good. We want to see why they did what they did. And you have to be objective to be able to do that. You can't get emotional about it. Of course, there's an emotional factor in there. But if you are just about emotion, you cannot see the main point. And this is what we're seeing with a lot of things. People are not taking a rational view. They're taking emotional and they're taking a bias this side or that side. And they can't see the real issue at the end of the day. And this is why academia is it's falling to pieces. If you have a ship and you put all your weight on one side of the ship, what happens to the ship? It sinks. <laughs> it's it's going to get to a point where it, it, it flips over to one side and, and uh, this, this is the problem. If we are unbalanced in, in academia and, and this, is, this is where a lot of the problems are coming from, we need to be able to be in the middle and discuss things in a in a very measured and uh, calm manner, even when those things are, you know, emotionally maybe not very pleasant. For example, my, my ethnic group is, is Africana and we were exterminated by the British, something that history also doesn't really remember. Does that mean I now have a hatred for every British person? It's illogical because those people did not live back then. They're just people living now. They they have no, they have no kind of uh, responsibility for the things that happened in the past. Just as I have no responsibility for what people did in apartheid. It wasn't me. Do I benefit from it? Well, that's a whole other discussion that you can go into. But uh, you know, it it doesn't make sense to take things from an emotional point of view because you cannot see the main point. That's, that's how I see it. That's why being in the, the middle is, is so important, especially for social sciences. The, the, these days too, you know, the way things are interpreted is there's no real empirical structure to it. Scientific method also, um, also impacts on the social sciences, but no one uses it anymore. This is, I think, I think this, so therefore it is. My feeling is this, so therefore it is. And, and uh, yeah, social sciences have gone down the drain. And I talk about that in the book. I mean, D'Angelo and uh, Ibram Olani Kendi, that's how you say it, Olani. Yeah, it, it's, it's a click. Uh, 
they've capitalized on, on that because the, their research is not so supported by by anything and yet people lap it up because it's the best type of propaganda the propaganda that allows them to support the points that they already feel and this is where we go when we have the emotional factor in uh, in research that's why i wrote the book and uh yeah, actually so that's something that's uh, sold, uh... Have you read Soul's uh, Intellectuals in Society? Yeah, I've read. I haven't read the whole thing. I've read parts of it. I mean, that was one of his. And, uh, that, and that was one of his fundamental points in that book was just the idea that the, especially the soft sciences, you actively profit off of using your uh, academic credentials in areas you have no expertise in at all, and because that's where if you if you're Noam Chomsky and you're a linguistics professor, the money is in writing inflammatory books about American foreign policy. So, you know what I mean? That's, this is a common thread that we see. And uh, the odd thing is that it makes so much money. I mean, it should be foreseeable because it's, it's it has an emotional factor once again. It, it's all about emotion, not about what can be proven. The thing is with... Uh, for example, uh, Robin DiAngelo's book, it's being debunked by so many people, including many black scholars, if you want to put a color on it, which I think is ridiculous, but for argument's sake, let, let's say that. And yet it's still a best-selling book because people want to believe it. It's, it's, you see, this whole world movement is a religion. The whole CRT, it's, it's a religion. It's not, it's not a... Uh, it's not a scientific theory. If it were a scientific theory, you'd be able to critique it. You're not allowed to critique religions, and hence this is where we are. It, it has its it has its godlike figure, which is is the greater good. It has its prophets like uh, D'Angelo and and Kendi. It's its spokespeople for the gods. And then you have all the, the lay masses underneath which say, yes, we are oppressed or, or we are oppressors. Please, <laughs> please teach us the way to enlightenment. It's a religion. It's, it's not a, and it's not even a theory. If you think about it, a theory is well tested and proven. It's, it's basically just a model to try and prove a point. you can't just use crt by itself and expect to have an unbiased result it's like it's it's a tool like using for example you're playing the game of chess and if you then just take one pawn and you have a look at it and you throw away all the other pieces and you throw away the chessboard and then you try to describe how the game is played without looking at anything else. That's what CRT is. Is it one component? Sure, perhaps. In certain circumstances, we could see how that could be used. But as a theory for everything, I'm sorry, it, it doesn't work. There's too many variables. No social sciences worth any mention. And, and this Jordan Peterson has said as well, is worth their salt if they do a univariate analysis because you will find what you want to find. And uh, we are finding that people are finding what they want to find. <laughs> this is a sad fact. Uh, that's, think... that's, that's why I wrote the book so that people can, can, you know, actually have a look and see the patterns that there are because these things all follow the same pattern. I compare, uh, let's have a look. I'll just find this section. Um, I'll read this, I'll read this little section for you, where is it? Mm. Come on. If I can find the page, I should mark the page earlier. Mm. 
live interview is a great <laughs> you can edit this later to make me look less ridiculous uh, we, 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 we all have the moments no worries <laughs> uh, oh. so this just goes back to the the victim the victim ideology which is which is such a popular ideology and uh, this basically sums up the modern uh, victim ideology if the race is in danger of being oppressed or even exterminated the question of legality is only of secondary importance the established power may in such a case employ only the means which are recognized as legal yet the instinct of self-preservation on the part of the oppressed will always justify to the highest degree, the employment of all possible resources. Who do you think wrote that? I, I'm I'm tempted to say one of the obvious answers, but <laughs> uh, Hitler or yeah, it, it was Hitler. And we see this same message being played over and over and over again which is uh, just a recycling of the facts. The other thing is, is this people, people which are extreme know that the center, the, the middle ground is so dangerous because it, it shows problems in the, in the logic. And that's why it is very important to get rid of that middle ground. People, they don't care if it's if it's that side or this side. The middle ground is the most dangerous place because it shows it shows both sides up for what they are. Um, and here's another quote for you: If it works against the people, against the general welfare, then it is treason against the fatherland. I will tolerate no opposition. We recognize only subordination, authority downwards, and responsibility upwards. And there is a motto in German, Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer. One people, one Reich, one leader. And there could be no middle ground in Nazi Germany. You were either Nazi or you were not. There was no, there was no, I, I don't think that this is a very good policy. You're an enemy automatically. We see Kendi saying something very, very similar, but there's no neutrality in the racist in struggle. One either allows racial inequities to persevere as a racist or either uh, confronts racial inequities as an anti-racist. There is no between safe space of not racist. The claim of not racist neutrality is a mask for racism. You're a witch. And if you say you're not a witch, <laughs> that proves you are a witch. Um, so, so we're at that point. Kendi, Kendi also has has a lot of flaws in his work when he's talking about children, like the, the anti-racist baby section. Um, I'm not sure if you... I've seen uh, photos <laughs> of anti-racist baby. <laughs> right, because uh, children are such racist creatures. So, um, well, um, children are barbarians, but they're not racist. <laughs> no, they, they, they tend to pick on other things. They, they, they tend to learn that later in life. Uh, the thing is, the points that he was making are completely wrong, which is obvious. But babies, for example, they are focused on language. The first thing that they, they start to learn is language. You actually start learning language prenatally. People think it's you are born and you start to learn language. You're learning language while you're developing in your mother's womb. You can't hear it properly, but you can hear the tone and the patterns. So your body is being programmed to, to recognize language, especially language that uh, pertains to you. Why? Because you need to survive. Your brain is wired that way. So if you grow up in a Spanish speaking household, you are naturally going to be more aware 
even as a baby, of people speaking Spanish. Now it goes further than that. Imagine you're a Spanish baby. You're a Mexican Spanish baby. Hola. Um, <laughs> you see, uh, now someone speaks Spanish from Spain. Now what happens? Two different cultures, two different dialects. Who do you think then the baby is going to pay attention to? There's a Mexican speaker here. There's a Spanish Spanish speaker. Spanish Spanish. Um, and <laughs> who's the baby going to pay attention to? Research shows that they will pay attention to their closest dialect. And this happens for English too. You you get a you get an American baby and you get Australian speaking Oka Australian. How you going? What's crack a lacking? They don't pay attention to it because it's like another language to them. They focus on their in group because they need to survive. That's a basic instinct. So children they are are programmed towards learning language. They will naturally then associate that language with a certain set of characteristics. So a black baby who is, you know, born to a family who speaks Ebonic style dialects, they learn that people that look like that speak like that. So when they see another black person, maybe they'll be more attentive because they expect without knowing that that person would be part of their in-group. It doesn't mean that they recognize that they themselves are black or white. This is the big difference. There is no cognitive idea at that stage that I am such and such, which is another thing why this gender story is such a ridiculous, uh, a ridiculous thing to be pushing forward that two or three year old kids can know their gender just any any development model it doesn't allow for for that to even happen uh, if you look at Vygotsky's models or Piaget's models kids are pretty dumb until they're four or five years old <laughs> they're just learning language they're just they're just on autopilot their personality is set at about two or three years of age that's why those developmental years are so important and that's probably why you shouldn't buy them anti-racist baby because you might damage them with it um but yeah basically that's that's the main point kids are geared towards learning language the the concept of self is something that comes much later i mean if you, if you have a baby right and there's a cat you have the baby in the chair it's looking at the cat when they're at six months old they're looking at the cat. The cat is cute. I like the cat. The cat goes behind the sofa. Oh my goodness. The cat has disappeared. The cat no longer exists. Why? Their brain says that if it's not in my line of vision, it does not exist. That's the point of development that they're at. When they're two and the cat goes behind the sofa, they realize the cat has not ceased to exist. The cat is still in the vicinity. It's just not in my line of vision. Now, if we look at these kinds of things, we can understand how, how the work by Kendi, in all due respect, is, is quite ridiculous. Yes. Uh, I, I believe McWater called him a, an academic featherweight, which I think is a, is a, is a fairly... It's a fairly spot on observation. Yes. Uh, so I wanted to point out facts like that in the book because people, they, they see an academic say these things and it seems authoritative. It seems researched, but really it's just, it's a great piece of fantasy writing. Let's put it that way. Fantasy has its genre. Yeah. And, oh, uh, people seem to like it a lot. The, um, the thing is, especially with developmental areas, if you if you damage kids at that stage by teaching them all this nonsense, it's very hard to reverse. So uh, 
I discussed this and some researchers, they looked at kids that went to school in Nazi Germany. And these kids were five or six years old when they were learning about how Jews are, you know, inferior. They found that after the war, there was more anti-Semitism than during the war. Older people who had survived during the war, war period were less anti-Semitic than the kids that came out of the war period after. And that they held those sentiments for a very long time. So that just shows you, you have to be very careful if you're teaching kids, oh, white is the oppressor and oh, this, these poor dark skinned kids, they'll never get ahead because, you know, that sounds very much like white supremacy repackaged into a new form for the sale to black people. I, I just, I think it's immoral to be teaching kids that, yeah. And I think that's why there's a big backlash. Oh, man. I, I can Carry listen, on, next I, question. I could listen to you talk about, to bully uh, Ibram X Kennedy all night, but I, it's probably best if we kind of wrap it up about now before the Zoom call crashes. Uh, no could you, uh, could you uh, uh, tell people where to find you uh, online and uh, where they can buy your book? Ah, uh, yes. Um, my book is on Amazon. Uh, that, that lovely, lovely place, I have to say that. Uh, it's available in ebook and it is available in the, the paperback. People have been asking for hardcover, but it's not, not an option at the moment. Uh, I have a website, nordia.eu, N-A-U-D-E.eu. My work is there. I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. I have a page on Facebook, which is not particularly popular. Um, and yes, that's that's about it. Uh, I have a blog, so I, I update things there, and people can read and laugh and uh, be depressed all at the same time. I'll, I'll throw I'll throw all these uh, into the link dump below the uh, episode. So if anyone wants to track it, all the stuff down, they can. But yeah, I mean, it, I appreciate being able to talk to you again. It was uh, fun to finally talk to you face to face. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I should be more coherent, you see, but I, I rarely do these kind of interviews. I'm like Saul. I try to I try to stay away and, and do all my fighting with words on on paper or or virtually. Yeah, I, but uh, you, you did fine. I, I used to do uh, public access television, so I've had more than my fair share of uh, teaching people in real time how to operate in front of a camera. It's a it's it, it's a skill. It takes a lot of uh, effort to get used to it but you did fine so thank you thank you for putting up with my rambling for a good hour that's this this show is mostly rambling so it fits in the aesthetic perfectly so <laughs> but yeah thank well, you well so that, that's that's what we're going for <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's an artistic choice but yeah have a good day <laughs> you too take care thanks for having me sure anytime The Antisocial Network is a Groupthink Productions podcast. Editing, producing, and hosting are by Tyler Hummel, artwork by Crystal Cowley, and original music was composed by Melissa LaFira and the late Dan Smola. Like, subscribe, and please let us know what you think about the show in the comments below if you'd like to see anyone interesting be a guest on the show. Thank you for listening.